my name is Erin Fernandez Palmer. Welcome to our second Global Talk in a series of uh, Global Talk once a month for the rest of the year. Uh, come on in. Uh, Carl's grabbing more chairs. We didn't realize when we were uh, marketing our Global Talk series that we were going to have so many takers. <laughs> we're not ready for so much influx. Um, so this is awesome. This is great. Uh, the purpose of our Global Talks um, were to and just not only the Global Talk series, but the new Global Concentration, Global Studies Concentration, and the classes that pertain to that Global Studies Concentration were to create a pathway for students to become uh, globally competent in terms of intercultural competency uh, and foreign languages. And uh, I work with Rebecca Ferdinand, philosophy instructor here at Green River, and on the Global Studies Concentration. And we actually created the Global Studies Concentration over the last couple of years. Um, our dream is now manifesting itself. It's, um, a, it's, a, it's a, a, an incredible sight to see so many people here um, involved in global studies um, and uh, global studies concentration in philosophy classes and foreign language classes and humanities classes. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, we appreciate your enthusiasm. And without further ado, I'd like to present um, Rebecca Ferreira, Professor of Philosophy, um, to present her uh, presentation on uh, gender equality and the yin-yang problems with traditional feminist interpretations and a potential solution. Uh, Rebecca has led the Taiwan Study Abroad Program. Uh, she's a tenured faculty member here at Green River College in philosophy, and um, some of you are already taking her classes. Um, and if you're not, maybe you'll be interested in taking one of her classes and we'll say it's concentration. So let's give her a, a round of applause. But uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, whether you are coming just because you're interested or coming for extra credit or because your teacher made you, we appreciate your presence, no matter your incentive. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to give this talk. It uh, picks up on a lot of things that we cover in some of our philosophy and gender studies courses here at Green River. Um, we're going to be talking today about Confucianism and Taoism. Um, we're going to be talking about the yin yang symbol and how it affects our understandings of gender, specifically the gender binary of masculinity and femininity. Um, and then we're going to talk about some ways in which it could potentially be problematic by assigning certain characteristics to certain genders rather than uh, being more fluid. And hopefully, um, this gives you a sense of some of the things that you could learn about and discuss if you were to take a philosophy class or a, a religions course or a gender studies course. Um, but it's also something that kind of goes above and beyond some of the things that we might dive into into any of those particular courses. So um, you're more than welcome to raise your hand for Alpha Talk if you have a question. There's a lot of information in here, a lot of information I don't expect you to have any background familiarity with. So um, I do have to go through it rather quickly just because of the time frame. But if you have a question or you'd like me to go back, um, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I'd be happy to take questions at the end, time will allow you. So as Erin mentioned, my name is Rebecca Ferreira. Uh, she pronounces my last name much better than I do. <laughs> I can't roll my R's like that. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here, so thank you again for coming. Uh, so to start off, I want to introduce the yin-yang symbol itself for those of you who might have maybe a cursory familiarity with it. So uh, traditionally, have you seen this symbol before? Yeah. Right? Yes, good. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you about are what types of uh, qualities or characteristics have traditionally been associated with different parts of the yin yang. So let's start with the light side or the yang side. Traditionally, uh, sun or light tends to be associated with this side of the symbol. Um, also having to do with heaven or references to uh, being above. We also have this being connected to notions of intellect, right? Oftentimes the sun is a symbol of knowledge or references to the heaven tend to be a symbol of knowledge or things having to do with the mind. It also tends to be that which is seen as in control of everything below it. It also tends to be associated with fire or heat, as it's connected to the sun and light. It is representative of things that are hard and full, active and bold, new and clean, boundless, positive, and masculine. So not only does this symbol represent certain facets of nature, right, or the cosmos or the universe, these associations also tend to correspond to a specific biological sex or gender identity, right? In this case, biological male, men, or masculinity. So we can imagine what sorts of characteristics we're going to see on the other side, right? The dark side. 
And if it sounds like something, uh, a movie to you, that's not an accident. <laughs> right? So on the dark side, we have the yin. We have the opposite of sunlight, moon and dark. Earth below, sensation or emotions, and hence being receptive. Water, cold, soft, empty, passive, subtle, old, and unclean, limited, and what do you think the last one's going to be? Negative and feminine. Okay. So the idea here is not only does this tell us certain things that rule or govern nature, things in nature, but you are a human, you are a part of nature, it tells us things about you. So how has this influenced certain traditions? Um, now these are philosophical traditions as well as sometimes uh, political or perhaps religious traditions. So I'm going to talk to you about them in more broad categories. And the first one is Confucianism. So we're looking at how this yin yang symbol has influenced certain ideologies in ancient Chinese traditions. So Confucianism, right, utilizes the yin yang through an emphasis on the book which gives us a description of the yin yang. The book is called the I Ching, or the Book of Changes. Ideally here, or understanding it as changes that happen within nature. Right? So in the Confucian tradition, this is one of five classic texts which one would study right? to cultivate virtue, to become a superior person, which is going to be understood as uh, gearing more towards the masculine qualities. But it has had um, an impact beyond Confucianism, because Confucianism has a long history in China with politics and government structure. It later became the basis of the imperial civil service examination. Right? These were things that you had to know if you wanted to have a job with the Chinese government, right, or in civil service. So this book has a huge influence not only on the culture in China and its history, but also on its political structure. The other tradition I want to talk to you about is its role in uh, Taoism. This is another Chinese tradition which emerged um, around the same time as Confucianism, right, and in Taoism, the I Ching are, is incorporated, but more as a representation of the Tao, right? of the way, of the path. And this is understood to be a pattern that is intrinsic to the universe itself. It is considered to be ever-changing, spontaneous, and invisible. However, the goal here is to not just become you know, a valued citizen by cultivating virtue, but to actually try to attune ourselves to the Tao. Right, that that is how we will achieve peace and harmony, right? first within ourselves and then in society, by attuning ourselves to these natural patterns in the universe. Now, philosophical Taoism pretty much ends there. Religious Taoism takes it a step further and says that if you can attune oneness with the Tao, you can actually achieve immortality. Right? So different ideas of what the Tao uh, serves, right? attuning oneself to it for various purposes, in Confucianism, to be a good citizen, right, to contribute to your society, and that will create peace and harmony. For Taoism, by attuning oneself as an individual, either for individual cultivation or for immortality. So, going back to the yin yang symbol, since both of these traditions um, are in China's history and have been very influential, not only in China but around the world, we tend to see an association of Confucianism with one side of the yin yang and Taoism with the other. Specifically, we see Confucianism associated here in the sense that it is additive, it is adding something to you that you do not already possess. It advocates for a direct influence from authority or top-down, right, things from above, right, giving us knowledge about how we ought to behave in Confucianism, right, the hierarchy of persons in society is very significant. Right? Every single person has their role. That role is meant to be subservient to another role. The people at the top are meant to take care of those below them, right? and those below are meant to help serve those above. Right? So this hierarchy is what helps keep everything going. So in the sense that it's hierarchical, it's also very anthropocentric or very human-centered, right? Confucianism, focusing on the cultivation of human virtues. And because of the emphasis on authority, 
and this top-down approach, education is very important for self-cultivation. You're not able to do it on your own. You need to study the text, you need to study with the teachers, you need to practice the rituals. This is how you cultivate virtue within yourself. And unfortunately, because it has been associated with this particular side of the yin yang symbol, cultivating virtue in Confucianism has been associated with masculinity. Specifically, the term for someone who has cultivated vir virtue, or junza, is most often translated to as gentleman. Right? So being a junza, being a superior person, means you are a gentleman. Right? So this notion has specifically excluded the idea that women could cultivate virtue, or at least that they could cultivate virtue in the same way as men. Right? Perhaps women have separate virtues, which are not as important. Another notion is the notion of being a sage, right? Someone who has superior wisdom. This too, historically, has been reserved for men. Taoism, on the other hand, tends to be associated with the dark side here, in that it is subtractive, meaning that in order to attune yourself to the natural patterns in the universe, you actually have to remove some of the things that society has put upon you, right? Get away from those hierarchical structures retain more of a spontaneous uh, way of going about the world. And so here, if we have any authority figures, their influence would only be indirect. So this way it is a non-hierarchical system, right? There's actually a large um, emphasis on being skeptical of teachers and texts and rituals, right? Those uh, cannot actually bestow knowledge to you, right? If I ever tried to put any word, you know, if I were to try to describe things about nature or the Tao, if you were to just figure out what you know about the Tao from my words, you would be missing out on a lot, right? Because the Tao is infinite, and I cannot possibly describe an infinite thing. So anyone who claims to be able to tell you knowledge, or share knowledge with you that way, you should be skeptical of them. So in this way, it's very non-anthropocentric, non-human-centered, right? We are just one of many pieces of the universe. And so it emphasizes, rather than education, active education and self-cultivation, we're turning more to a spontaneous way of going about things. So they'll emphasize virtues um, like Wu Wei or non-action, right? Which is about effortlessly going through life, right? Not trying to actively or aggressively make way or uh, affect things in the world, right? We want to attune ourselves in a way that things just happen spontaneously and naturally. Uh, some people may say this is analogous to any of you play sports, being in the zone, right? <laughs> you don't have to think about it. It just kind of happens, it just kind of flows, right? You don't have to put much effort into it. Maybe you have to practice to get to that space, but once you're there, things just occur correctly and naturally. And that's the emphasis here. So in Taoism, we don't see an emphasis on masculine character traits. We see an emphasis on a universal nature that we all share that is either conceived of as genderless, or when it is gendered, is an emphasis of the feminine. Right, so because of these different emphasis of the yin-yang, we see different uptake of various gender roles in Confucianism and Taoism. And I'm going to get more specific about how this is important. So in Confucianism, what have been some of the implications for this emphasis? Well, I mentioned that the yin-yang comes from the book The I Ching, and the, the I Ching doesn't say much about women, but what it does say is one thing, um, it has to do with this hexagram right here, which are the various symbols that are associated with the yin yang. Um, but basically, the only time women are mentioned in the yin ching, I ching is that they are subordinate to men. Does anyone know what subordinate means? Sort of like authority. So if you are in a subordinated position, do you have authority? No, not Exactly, or someone else, right, who is in a superior or authoritative position over you. Good, right, so someone who is subordinated by that could be, a, we could also describe them as being oppressed or dominated, right, by that superior group. So in this case, right, the only time women are mentioned, at, as far as this whole picture of nature is supposed to be giving us, is that women naturally are subordinated to men. So when Confucian, uh, Confucian has set up this sort of structure of what society should look like, women are placed in subordinated roles, right? Women are supposed to take one of three roles in their life. When they are daughters, they are subordinated to whom, can you guess? Father. 
fathers when they are wives they are subordinated to husbands when they are mothers they are subordinated to sons or their children but mostly their sons so we see this reinforced over and over again that a woman's proper role in Confucianism is to be subordinated to a man when Kongza or uh, you know, Confucius himself talked about women. He only mentions them once as a, being in a proper role. He says that there are five bonds that are specifically important. That's the bond between a ruler and a subject, between a father and a son, between a husband and a wife, between an older brother and a younger brother, and an older friend and a younger friend. So again, women here are only mentioned once directly and as being subordinated to their husbands. This has led to really uh, fractured and different practices with regard to gender. So we see this sometimes uh, physically. There were actual physical barriers at certain points throughout China's uh, history, even within the home. So a physical barrier where the inner chambers are where the women would be and the outer chambers are where the men would be. Later on, this became more of a ritualistic barrier or separation between the genders, where you weren't allowed to show your face or touch even uh, very innocently, a member of the opposite sex. So there were rituals about how uh, women should pass things to other men in the household. They needed to put it in a basket, set the basket down, and someone else could pick up the basket. Uh, there's even rules about if there's a fire in the house and you need to run out, make sure that you're willing to veil your face before you do so. Right? So they, they took these barriers very seriously, right? this idea that women are meant to be in this specific role. Right? as being subordinated to and more private than the public role that men take. So one of the things that has happened throughout the history of philosophy is that we get um, a feminist approach which tries to say, okay, let's look back through the history, let's see some potential problems with gender inequality, and let's try to reinterpret them more positively. Right? How can we take these teachings and allow them to be more equal? with respect to gender, right? Let's not just throw out a tradition, right? And everything that it's taught us and everything that it's given us, just because there might have historically been some problems. And so some of the ways in which feminists have tried to more positively uh, reinterpret the Confucian traditions are as follows. Um, we get a set of texts that specifically are geared towards teaching women how to cultivate virtue, right? Since most of the texts have been about focusing on how men can cultivate their virtue. So this is the most famous text for women. It's called Lessons for Women. And here we get an, extra, uh, an instruction manual for daughters on how to be virtuous, unfortunately still, yes, subservient wives, right? Which is why it's uh, historically seen as a problematic text. But it's also important because this author acknowledges that a woman should leave the house if her husband is abusing her, right? Because the whole hierarchy is supposed to imply that those that on the top are supposed to take care. Right, of those who are subordinated to them. So if that care is not being done, then you have a permission to leave the home. She also advocated for the education of women, right, which is something that hadn't been done before. Because of course, if women are supposed to be in the home, and that's where the children are learning, right, and that, that's where they're first learning how to be good people, well then we need our mothers, right? We need our women to be educated so that they can teach the children properly. Right, so she, a more positive interpretation of the role and the significance that the women played within the home. So theoretically here again, both husband and wife were supposed to be respectful and considerate to one another. We also have another text called The Classic of Filial Piety for Women. If you're familiar with Confucianism, you might know about the virtue of filial piety, right? making sure that you are being respectful and caring for uh, you have special obligations to those members of your family who are older than you, who are superior to you. And here again, we see an emphasis on women's education. Women should, cult should study the Confucian classics if we expect them to be virtuous wives, daughters, and mothers. Since women are in the home, and that is where moral education begins, um, the idea here is that women actually should be the moral guides to men. So we might even need women to be better than their husbands, right? better than their sons, better than their fathers. Uh, this always makes me think of that line from my big frat Greek wedding. If anyone has seen that? Right? The, the man is the head of the household and the woman is what? The neck. The neck. She turns the head whichever way she wants. 
right? So this sort of idea, if the men are out in the public sphere making the political decisions, right, that affect society, well, right, women can have influence on that through their husbands, right? They can impact the world in this way. So again, we need women to have a high moral standard. We need to educate them and expect a lot from them rather than just seeing them as being subservient. Here, the most virtuous women were seen as being inwardly stronger than their husbands and thus able to correct their immoral behavior. So to be a truly virtuous wife meant in some cases that you had to be better than your husband. Right? So we are <laughs> elevating the standard of virtue for women. It also reinterpreted the confinement to the interior chambers as a sort of refuge, right? A place where women could be with other women, right? To be relaxed, not necessarily partake in the duties that they are held to throughout the rest of the day. So these are some of the feminist interpretations that we get, which try to reframe this historical subordination of women in a slightly more positive way, right? Elevating their morality, placing them at the center of all social peace and harmony by being responsible for the moral education of their children and perhaps even sometimes their husbands, and then saying that they're being resigned specifically to the uh, in inner chambers or the private sphere is actually something that they enjoy. However, there are some problems with these interpretations. First off, uh, if a woman failed to comply with her duties, right, the specific virtues that were laid out for her, there were very strict and harsh consequences for that. Um, specifically, an example of this is that there are seven grounds considered disturbing to the success of a marriage, which could result in the wife being expelled from the house. And to give you a sense of what these are, uh, these are grounds for a husband to divorce his wife, right, because she would be disturbing the peace and harmony in the household, and thus having that ripple effect out into the world, disturbing the peace and harmony of society. And it is important to note that these are the seven grounds for a husband divorcing a wife and not the other way around. So I'll give you an example of what these are. The first one is disobeying one's in-laws, right, as a violation, again, of filial piety. If a woman, oh, that's supposed to say childless, right? So if a woman could not bear children, right, that would be grounds for divorce. If the wife committed adultery, again, not the other way around. If the wife was jealous, specifically if the husband had other wives, right? A wife could not be jealous of these other wives, or if the, uh, the husband had uh, a mistress or a concubine, the wife could not be jealous of any attention that the husband gave to anyone else. If the wife had an incurable disease, if the wife spoke too much, or if the wife stole. And again, these are potentially problematic, not just because of perhaps we don't think these are grounds, or legitimate grounds for divorce, but also because of the double standard, right? It was not the case that a wife could divorce her husband, right? Or leave her husband in a socially acceptable way should he do anything. Additionally, we have uh, other sorts of potential problems, right? So we see the feminists trying to elevate certain virtues that are just for women, but when you go back through the history of the Chinese text, specifically in this book, The Biographies of Women, you see that the types of moral dilemmas that men had were mostly about politics, right? Um, you know, whether or not to go to war, whether or not uh, to conquer this other land, or to engage in some sort of deal with this maybe former enemy, and we see a totally different set of moral dilemmas that women encounter, and even though the men's dilemmas, you think would war it, the result would be death, you often see the resolution of these dilemmas result in death more often for women, ironically, so I want to give you a sense of what that means. But specifically, right, if women ever entered into a situation where they had to choose between doing the unvirtuous thing or the vicious thing, and sacrificing their life, for women, the virtuous thing was always to sacrifice their life. So for example, one of these very famous stories is about um, a female housemaid who is serving a married couple, and for some reason or another, the wife is trying to poison her husband, and so tasks the handmaid with uh, delivering this poison, right? So this, this female housemaid has a dilemma. Right? She needs to obey her master, but on the other hand, right, if she does that, she's going to commit murder against her other master. And so the resolution of this is that she commits suicide. 
So she neither has to disobey nor lie nor kill. Right? There seems to be the implication that there's no other resolution available to her other than taking her own life. We see similar stories if women's uh, uh, virginity or sexual virtue is under threat of women. Literally, the virtuous thing would be to fling themselves off a cliff rather than have their virtue taken. And we might think that these are extraordinary circumstances, right? These don't often occur. But this text was actually supposed to be a guide for how women should live their daily lives. Right? If ever you should enter into a situation in which you have to choose between righteousness or virtue over your own life, for women, the message was clear. Choose virtue. Right? Sacrifice your life in order to do the virtuous thing. So now I'm going to move on to Taoism and the ways in which women have been affected here. Now, I will say that historically, feminists have been a little bit more optimistic about Taoism, as you saw. It tends to associate either a feminine or elevated feminine notion of virtue, or at least a genderless notion of virtue. So even though uh, religious Taoism in specific, uh, specifically tends to offer more positions of leadership to women, tends to acknowledge people's spiritual potential regardless of gender, and elevates feminine aspects of the divine, the use of various sexual techniques as a method for enlightenment has been problematic and has historically ex exploited or excluded women. And I'm going to talk to you more about this, but just to let you know, there are lots of, uh, in every major world religion, you'll typically find a branch of that religion which utilizes some form of sexual activity, either on one's own or with a partner, as a way of attaining spiritual enlightenment. Right? So there are branches of this, uh, you might maybe have heard of the tantric branches of Buddhism or Hinduism. Right? There are similar sorts of branches like this in uh, Taoist philosophy and Taoist religion. Now feminists have interpreted these sorts of elevations of the divine in very positive ways, so I'm going to talk to you about those first, and then I'm going to talk to you again about how these have been problematic. But specifically the idea here is that feminists think, look, there's a lot of room to elevate the feminine in Taoism in ways in which it has been subordinated in Confucianism. And they say, historically, we can see this in five different ways. The first is that we tend to see the Tao when it is gendered. We see it described as a mother-type figure. So certain metaphors are used to describe it as a womb, right, within which the entire universe is held. It has the creative power to give life, right? So we see a lot of um, religions which sometimes describe the divine capacity for life in feminine terms by highlighting it as a mother type figure. So this again is an emphasis of yin over yang. We see Tao as a, a balancing of qi. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of qi before. It's your vital energy force, right? So the idea here is that again, in order to attain oneness with the Tao, most, some of us, if you are feminine, it's believed you have a predisposition towards yin over yang. If you are a male, you would have a predisposition for yang over yin. And the goal, of course, is to attune oneself with the Tao, so we need to balance our yin and yang. So how best to do that, except for the joining of a man and a woman via sexual intercourse, right, as a way of balancing the chi. And this is very interesting because it utilizes concepts of sexual vampirism, where you're literally sucking the force from another person. Makes a second tell you the right word. But, right, you are uh, balancing out. You are giving some and receiving some of the energy, that vital life energy force, from the other individual. And through that combination via sexual intercourse, that is how you achieve oneness with the death. We also see historically, uh, as I mentioned before, that women have been honored as teachers and masters of the Tao, right? saying that because they have a predisposition for yin over yang, they have special or secret spiritual techniques that allow them to attain oneness with the Tao more easily than men. We then historically see the opposite, right? So in as much as sexual intercourse was used as a method for achieving spiritual enlightenment, we also see branches of Taoism which advocate for celibacy, right? Refraining from any sort of sexual activity. So here, there tends to be a, an acknowledgement of spiritual equality between men and women. And women are seen as having greater potential, right, even though everyone can achieve enlightenment, because again, it's assumed that women are more easy, uh, it's easier for them to practice celibacy, right, to refrain from sexual intercourse. 
And then the last one is probably the most interesting one. Uh, this is the Tao for inner alchemy, and this is the idea that, again, by refraining not just from sexual acts, but by refraining from a certain flow of the bloods and humors of the body, you can attain oneness with the Tao this way. And so what this involves is a practice of meditation to achieve inner tranquility, where it's believed that you can actually transform your musculoskeletal skeletal structure, reverse the energy and flow of one's bodily fluids, and merge with the Tao by eliminating all distinctions within yourself. So this means that any bodily fluids that identify you as a biological male or as a biological female should not be released from the body. Oh, that, <laughs> that you should, in fact, <laughs> reverse the flow of these bodily fluids, right? thus distinguishing or uh, failing to distinguish yourself as a biological male or female, and this is how you attain oneness with the Tao. So here it is believed that women were especially more, uh, had more potential for this activity, that it was easier for them to engage in this. And there are specific names for males and females, different process for different biologies. For males, it was called spiritual luminosity. And for females, it was called slaying the dragon. We can come back to this, I think. I don't have questions. <laughs> Right, but again, in general, the idea here is that the feminist philosophers tend to think that Taoism has a lot of potential for gender equality because of the ways in which they highlight the spiritual potential of women, and they think that the Tao has specifically feminine characteristics which should be elevated over and above the masculine characteristics. So, are we done? Taoism is better for women? Not necessarily. Even though Taoism has placed greater emphasis on the feminine, or yin, and has been viewed by feminist theologians as having greater potential for gender equality, unfortunately there remains a concern. Um, it's not a widely held concern, but it's one that I certainly hold, and it's why I'm giving this talk today. Which is that even though Taoism elevates yin over yang, it still engages in this practice of associating femininity with a certain set, char set of characteristics. Right? Those that fall within the yin. Right? Femininity is always going to be soft, subtle, empty, passive. And masculinity is always going to be hard, full, active, aggressive. And this I find to be particularly problematic because I don't think that one's gender identity is necessarily dictated first of all, by one's biological sex. Right? Or second of all, that if you identify as a woman or as a man, that that means you all share the same characteristics. When we do this, when we act as if one's biological sex or gender identity fits just one set of characteristics, we are engaging in an action called essentialism. Essentializing is the tendency to reduce something or someone to certain characteristics that we assume are essential to its nature and thus present in every member of a category. Biological essentialism specifically has to do with the ways in which we essentialize sex, gender, and sexuality. So if you are a biological essentialist, First off, you maintain that there are only two biological sexes, male and female, so there's no acknowledgement of intersex identity here. If you are born a biological female, a biological essentialist predicts that you will and ought to be identifying as a man, and that you will be attracted to the opposite sex, that you will be heterosexual. It assumes that if you are born a biological female, that you will identify as a woman, and that you will be attracted to the opposite sex, males. And more specifically than that, it is going to maintain that those characteristics which are associated with biological males and biological females will dictate what sort of skills you have. Perhaps you've heard of some of these stereotypes. What sorts of things are, are men better at? 
Sports. Engineering. Engineering. Finance, because I get that a lot. Math. Right? Yeah, we hear women are not good at math. Or interested in it, apparently. Or science. Or technology. Or philosophy, historically. <laughs> yeah. What are women good at? Cleaning. Cleaning. Nurturing. Nurturing. Cooking. I'm not good at cooking. <laughs> Raising children? Clothes, they're interested in clothes. Other things associated with their bodies. <laughs> so we see we, these things, we're not unfamiliar with them. Right? We're not unfamiliar with these stereotypes. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take uh, just a minute or two before I continue on. And I would like you to, if you have some paper in front of you, or if not, maybe just brainstorm a little bit. I would like you to make two columns, one that has characteristics that you associate with masculinity, and maybe it's not even that you associate with, but that you know historically have been associated with masculinity, and another column of characteristics that you know or think have been historically associated with femininity. And these can be all the stereotypes that you don't believe or all the ones that you do. That's totally fine. All right, so you can keep working. I'm going to talk a little bit more while you're constructing your list or while you're thinking of these things. Um, I'm going to skip over this little bit about uh, Chinese language just for the sake of time to make sure we have time for questions. But the idea here is that perhaps we want to acknowledge not only that one's biological sex or gender need not determine certain characteristics about you or what you're interested in or what you're good at, right? but perhaps there is a separation between sex and gender. Right? that one need not even determine anything about the other. So the difference right, between, mass, uh, between feminine characteristics and masculine characteristics over history have been trying to be portrayed as complementary. Right? Yes, they're opposites, and they fit well together, just like the yin-yang, right? which is what underwrites a heteronormative assumption, right? That men and women ought to be in sexual relationships with each other because opposites complement each other. However, hopefully we can understand that a complementary relationship does not necessarily entail equality. Can anyone think of an example of a complementary relationship that is unequal? Master and slave. There's even a level of dependence there even from the master to the slave. Maybe they have special obligations to the slave. Maybe they're even meeting all those obligations. That does not necessarily entail equality. In fact, in this case, it's very unequal. You want to think of any other examples? Owners and workers. Good. Right? People who own companies and their employees. Right? There are certain obligations shared in both directions, right? special duties that one has that might, one might even be fulfilling, but there is absolutely an inequality there, right? a power dynamic. Uh, pets to owners. Pets to owners, right? Anyone think their pet compliments them? <laughs> <laughs> right? Certainly an inequality there, right? uh, depending on how much freedom you give your pet, but they're reliant upon you in a number of ways, right? which creates an unequal power dynamic. Student teacher, absolutely, right? I hope I compliment my students, right? But absolutely, there's a power dynamic, an unequal one. Parent and child, excellent. Right, so we can see lots of examples of relationships that might complement each other, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they, they entail equality. Right, and we're concerned with gender equality here, not just gender complementaries. So a biologically based gender distinction, oftentimes, and in fact almost always, it implies a predestined and potentially limiting biological and social fate for each person. It tells you what you should do because of what it assumes you will be good at. However, this sort of idea tends to ignore similarities between men and women, or between people of different gender identities, it also tends to oversimplify the differences by saying that they're just based on biology, when in fact the biological differences between males and females are quite small. We even know this from uh, a 
assessing the voice box, right? We think that women have higher pitched voices. But the actual difference in the, the biological makeup of a male voice box versus a female is almost insignificant. All right, I could make my voice like this. <laughs> and a guy can make a voice like this. We're capable of lots of things. Uh, they've even done some studies uh, of um, girls throwing a baseball. And it shows that they actually hold back. They're not even throwing the ball as hard as they can. Or maybe you've seen that uh, hashtag, like a girl. Do you remember those ads? You ask the adults to run like a girl. And, and you ask kids to run like a girl, and, and the girls just run. <laughs> right? This is something that was taught to them later on in life. Right? The biological differences are not as severe or deterministic about what you are or what you're good at as we assume them to be. And they tend to treat your biological sex as isolated from all of the other things that we encounter in society. As we know, sex and gender sometimes go together and sometimes they don't. Sometimes sexual orientation is dictated by our sex or gender, and sometimes it's not. But if we're even just looking at this from an Eastern philosophical perspective, this idea violates a core principle in Taoism a principle called the unity of opposites. So because Taoism places more of an emphasis not just on the yin over yang, but one thing we haven't talked about is within yang, yang is what side do you remember? The light or the dark side? Light side. Within yang is what? A little bit of yin. And within yin is a little bit of yang. Right? Taoism really highlights this. Specifically, they even talk about um, an example of uh, a horse. So can everyone picture a horse? Right. Now, according to the Taoist philosophers, for you to truly understand what a horse is, if I were to ask you to describe it, you might describe it as uh, having four legs, right? Well, this chair has four legs. Does that make this chair a horse? No. In order to know what something is, according to Taoist philosophers, you also have to know what it's not. And in this understanding, this true understanding, within every concept is its negation, is its opposite. To know what a table is, you have to know what things are that are not tables. So because of this, Right? Sometimes we need to know that describing something by what it's not can be more useful than describing what it is. So, the idea here is that when we use words, yin and yang, up and down, right? control, receptive, additive, subtractive, right? what we're really doing is using a way of communicating with each other. It's not necessarily the case that we're describing things as they truly are. So just because we use certain words to relay a uh, set of information doesn't mean that those words are inherent or fundamental to the nature of that thing. Right? We might use words to describe masculinity and femininity while simultaneously knowing that not everyone who's masculine has those character traits. While knowing that not everyone who's feminine has those character traits. Right? You might identify as a man, but also think that you have some feminine character. And you might even think that doesn't make you an unmanly man. So what I'd like to propose here is that Chinese uh, philosophy of gender takes something from traditional Chinese medicine, which is another area in which the yin-yang has been uh, a huge focus. Specifically, the idea that every single part of your body, from the smallest drop of sweat to the largest, most central organ, has both yin and yang within it. And so traditional Chinese medicine approaches making people healthy by balancing out the yin and yang in every part of your body. So even though we associate femininity with yin and masculinity with yang, your body is truly composed of yin and yang. So I am trying to propose that we incorporate something uh, of an understanding about gender's relationship to the union that is more consistent with this idea, where a true balance of any entity is not the merging of people with yin and people with yang, 
but balancing the yin and yang within yourself. And if we associate yin and yang with masculine and feminine characteristics, that means balancing those characteristics in yourself. Not forcing yourself to conform just to what you perceive of as feminine characteristics, or just what you perceive of as masculine characteristics. This is different, again, from requiring two separate entities to merge together. Like we saw in the sexual vampirism, right? when you balance your chi through sexual intercourse. Specifically, right, the human body in traditional Chinese medicine is broken up into three levels. Again, where yin and yang both operate. The internal, the external, the front and the back, and then each organ. Right, the front and back of it, the internal and external parts of it. So you can get sick then if a specific organ has an excess or deficiency of either yin and yang. And then the goal is to rebalance that through diet or exercise. In this way, if we were just talking about your kidney, for example, we can talk about the kidney mostly being yin, but then when we really get into it, we also need to talk about the inside mostly being yin. And this sometimes is most often talked about in terms of hot and cold, right? Using temperature to solve these problems. But what happens when we acknowledge that every single part of your body has both yin and yang in it, what we're doing is no longer retaining any specific meaning in those concepts themselves. We're simply using these terms to function as categorizing symbols. They do not become one, but form a dynamic system. And I think that this mirrors how we understand our gender identity already. For yourself, even if you identify as just masculine or just feminine, I'm sure that means something different to you now than when you were a kid. And I'm sure as you get older, what your gender identity and those gender roles will, be, will mean something else, right? They're constantly changing. They change based on changes in society, they change based on our experiences as we learn more about ourselves. So a healthy gender identity in this case is one that is balanced between yin and yang and is constantly transforming. One can be male, female, both, or none. And by understanding yin and yang as constitutive of both genders, or all genders, femininity need not be based in the exclusion of the masculine, and masculinity need not be based in the rejection of the feminine. And that's all the time I have.